right? Yes, yeah, so let's start. Right? So hi, um, I'm Seth Hiroshima, and I'm going to be presenting some joint work I've done with Will and Tom on how to construct tweetable block ciphers uh, with beyond birthday bound security guarantees. So tweetable block ciphers are a symmetric key primitive that were uh, initially proposed in a paper by Liz Carver Vest and Wagner in 2002. Uh, the idea here is that we're, they're very similar to a regular block cipher, but we have this extra input the tweak. And each time we change the tweak, we get a brand new permutation. The idea here is that um, the tweak provides built-in support for variability, which block cipher-based constructions usually obtain through ad hoc means. And this built-in variability makes tweakable block ciphers sort of a very natural starting point uh, for designing symmetric key constructions. In practice, uh, TBCs have been used for a wide variety of things. Uh, this includes authentication, uh, authenticated encryption. An example here is uh, Rogway's OCB. Macs and PRFs, uh, PMAC and PMAC Plus are examples of this. The Skein hash function, which was uh, one of the SHA-3 contenders, is built using a triple block cipher. And a recent paper by Minamatsu and Iwata give a uh, block cipher domain uh, extension construction that uses triple block ciphers. Uh, various other constructions can also be viewed as being built from a tweetable block cipher, uh, even if they're not cast this way explicitly by the authors. Examples here include even cipher block chaining, um, EME, EME star, which are, uh, again, domain extensions. So here's the formal security experiment for a tweakable, uh, strong tweakable pseudorandom permutation. The experiment is very similar to uh, the PRP setup. We have this adversary who has black box access to some oracle. Uh, in this case, the oracle t takes two inputs rather than one, the tweak and uh, the block input. And the adversary is trying to distinguish between two possible worlds. In the first world, the, his oracle is the tweakable block cipher that we're considering. Uh, that uses some random key K. In the second world, world zero, his oracle instead instantiates an ideal cipher or a random block cipher that uses the tweak as its key. So put differently, uh, each time the adversary sees, changes the tweak in world zero, he gets a uniformly random permutation that's independent of the others. Note that unlike the key, which also uh, parameterizes a permutation. The tweak is explicitly under the adversary's control. So the adversary uses his oracle. He tries to guess which world he's in. If he can't do so with any reasonable uh, probability, then the tweakable block cipher is secure to strong uh, tweakable pseudorandom permutation. Now, how would you go about building a tweakable block cipher? Well, here's a very naive first attempt. Okay, so let's just take the tweak. Let's assume it has the same length as the block cipher input and x the two together. So the problem here is that it's very easy for the adversary to tell that this is not an ideal cipher. There's an obvious relationship between different tweaks that the adversary can exploit. So here's the first attempt at patching this. What if we also x the tweak in at the end? Again, this fails. It doesn't get us anywhere. Uh, the relationship between two different tweaks is pretty easy to derive, shown there. So the problem here, really, is that the adversary has too much control over what goes into the block cipher, and he can easily reproduce the value that comes out of it. We can solve both of those problems simultaneously by putting the tweak through a hash function. And this gives us the construction that uh, Liz Carver, Vess, and Wagner proposed. Uh, we call it LRW2 because it's the second one they proposed. I don't think they gave a name for it. Um, and this gives us birthday bound security in terms of being a strong uh, TPRP under the assumption that 
uh, the block cipher E is likewise secure and that H is an um, epsilon almost sex universal hash function. Uh, the birthday bound is tight in the sense that you can find uh, attacks, distinguishing attacks that succeed with high probability using about square root of 2dn queries. Minamatsu's construction, tweet dependent rekeying, um, gives us beyond birthday bound security guarantees, which is wonderful. So it works by putting the tweak uh, through a block cipher, which we think of as being a PRF, and using the output as a key that we use to process the block. Um, so it's awesome that we get birthday bound, I mean, beyond birthday bound security here, but unfortunately, there are a couple uh, limitations. First, and I think most significantly, the tweak must be shorter, uh, much shorter than half the width of the block cipher. Uh, this restriction prevents us from using uh, this construction in various modes of operation where we might want to chain values through the tweak or use the tweak to enforce some sort of domain separation. Additionally, this construction requires us to change the key we're using every time we change the tweak. Um, this incurs some speed penalty and you know it's not what block types are typically designed to handle. So our design goals were to find a construction that gives us beyond birthday bound security guarantees uh, while permitting arbitrarily length tweaks and also avoiding the need to rekey uh, the underlying components. Here's what we came up with. Uh, chained LRW2 is essentially two rounds of LRW2. Uh, we use the same tweak for both rounds. So we'll prove, I'll sketch the outline, that this does indeed give us beyond the birthday bound security guarantees. It uses standard primitives, in this case box ciphers and hash functions, and we don't need to rekey anything, and we have arbitrarily wide tweaks, uh, restricted only by the domain of the hash function we can construct, which is in practice not really a problem. We actually didn't go into this trying to analyze you know, what happens if we use two rounds of LRW2. We found some construction that worked and tried to optimize it as much as we could. And then a couple weeks later, Tom said, hey, this is two rounds of LRW2. So that made it easy to name at any rate. Here's our main result. Uh, if chained LRW2 is defined as above, then we get the following security bound, uh, the tilde over the SPRP indicates that it's tweakable uh, SPRP that we're considering here. So we have a reduction to the security of the block cipher E plus some other term. Um, for practical values of E hat that we can easily achieve, this second term is roughly equal to Q cubed over two to the two n. So that means that we have security till around uh, two to the two n over three queries rather than the birthday bound. And here's a graph that shows this visually. So assuming that we have a secure 128 bit block cipher, chained LRW2 is secure, we lose security guarantees only after um, around two to the 85 queries, whereas uh, constructions that use, that give us birthday bound security uh, break around two to the 64. If you're interested in whether and when these bounds exceed some you know, given constant like two to the minus 40 rather than when they become completely vacuous, the gap between these two curves uh, grows even further. So now let's talk about uh, the intuition behind the construction and its proof. So here's our starting point, the LRW2 tweakable block cipher. So we've made the obvious first step in the proof of replacing the block cipher with this random permutation pi. And as is very typical in these sorts of proofs, we run into problems when there are collisions. Uh, for example, if there are two queries that put the same value on that indicated wire, then lazy sampling techniques uh, give us no new randomness that we can exploit on the second such query. And as a result, uh, these type of constructions behave very similarly to an ideal cipher until there's some sort of internal collision. This presents a pretty significant problem when you're trying to get beyond the birthday bound because tuple block ciphers are inherently a many-to-one function. 
And so in that sense, these internal collisions are inevitable. However, our intuition here is that maybe if we can show that a construction can behave very similarly to an ideal cipher, unless there are two independent collisions on the same query, uh, then that would, should give us beyond the birthday bound security guarantees. And so that's what motivates this structure. Uh, the problem, of course, is showing that this is indeed what happens. Uh, our analysis breaks us down into two cases. So we say, okay, first let's look at what happens if there's a collision at that first point. It's pretty easy to show, using standard techniques, that unless there's also a collision at the second point, um, our distribution on outputs looks very close to what we want it, so there's no problem there. The more interesting case is when there is no collision at the first block cipher, and we want to show that we can withstand the collision at the second point. So, in this case, we have some distribution on the possible outputs that's given by the blue curve, the CLRW2 distribution on outputs. And we want to show that that's very similar to the distribution we, get, we would get from an ideal cipher, shown here with a dotted purple line. And you can break down the outputs into these four sets uh, that make it very easy to analyze the distributions involved. And indeed, th these curves are very close to each other. The statistical difference between the two distributions ends up being proportional to uh, the size of the set S3, uh, which basically corresponds to the set of outputs that are impossible to return, given that there is no first round collision. Most of our analysis then is showing that the size of this set, S3, remains essentially negligibly small, um, even against adaptive adversaries. So having seen this construction, there are some, I think, natural questions to ask. One of the first is, can we reduce the number of keys? So here we're using four keys, two for the hash functions, two for the block ciphers. And that seems maybe a bit cumbersome. So I don't know of any attacks that using the same block cipher key twice, for example, would allow. That being said, I also can't prove that no such attacks exist. Trying to make this modification to the proof uh, would require very non-trivial changes to its already uh, a rather long technical proof. Uh, the second question is, okay, so one round of LRW2 gives us birthday bound security. We get uh, you know, two to the two n over three queries if we use two rounds. So what if we use three or even four rounds? And you know, using pattern matching, the conjecture here is that if we have r rounds, then perhaps we can get security to around two to the r n over r plus one queries. Um, Again, I don't have a proof for this, but I suspect that this is indeed the case. Finally, is this construction overkill? Can we simplify this um, by, say, removing some of these XOR operations? The answer to this question is no. Um, if you remove any one of these XORs, I can give you a birthday attack. And so in that sense, this uh, construction is optimal. So, Chained LRW2 is our main result. Uh, we have some others. Let's look at one of them. In the Tweeple Block Cipher paper, uh, Liskoffer, Vest, and Wagner proposed TBC MAC, uh, the construction shown here. <coughs> it's essentially the same thing as CBC MAC, except the chaining value uh, goes through the tweak. In fact, you can view CBC MAC as a particular instantiation of this construction. So we did the security analysis, and it turns out that you only get birthday bound type security. And this is disappointing. Uh, Tweepole block ciphers are much more powerful primitive than regular block ciphers. We have a whole set of random permutations rather than just one. So surely we should be able to get better than uh, the birthday bound. And in fact, we can. Our strategy here is to uh, take advantage of the fact that we can use wide tweaks to get domain separation. So this construction is TBC MAC2. 
and we're very creative with our names here. Um, we chain through the tweak, but we extend the tweak to allow uh, domain separation. Uh, so we have this you know, middle zero that gets changed to a one for the last block. So that means that there's domain separation within a query. And the fact that we have this nonce n means there's additional domain separation between different queries. And so there are two sort of cool things about this. The first is that we get a tight reduction to the security bound for the underlying treatable block cipher. So if we use CLRW2, we have a PRF with beyond birthday bound security guarantees. Secondly, this construction is very resistant uh, to nonce misuse. Uh, the worst case scenario where the nonce is a constant, uh, we recovered birthday bound security. Uh, the security, the degradation between these two extremes is smooth in that, uh, in general, the second term is quadratic in the maximum number of times a nonce is repeated. So this construction um, is very robust uh, against implementation errors or so on uh, by programmers, which is a pretty nice feature to have. All right, so uh, thank you for your attention. I hope uh, you're <laughs> able to use these constructions to build fun things. Thank you very much.